Let's start our uh, lecture for today. In today's lecture, we will be uh, introducing a new material. Today, we will be talking about, uh, in that chapter, about two more elements that are uh, very important in our circuits, capacitors in this lecture and inductors in the coming lecture. So, what are those uh, capacitors? You have seen and dealt with those capacitors before in uh, previous uh, courses, Physics 1010, for example. So uh, in this lecture, we will uh, refresh your memories and we will uh, introduce those uh, two elements. At least in this, in this lecture, we'll, talk, we'll be talking about the capacitor. So capacitors and our inductors in general are considered passive elements. They don't dissipate energy ideally. Ideally, the energy is being stored in those two um, linear elements that we will be using them in our circuits. So the energy is being stored, as I said, the energy and the capacitor is being stored in the electric field, while the energy in the inductor, as we'll see later on, will be stored in the magnetic field. So what is the capacitor? Capacitor can be uh, defined uh, as uh, two plates that are facing each other with a, with a separation. This separation could be uh, of air, for example, or of a dielectric material that is considered an insulator between those two plates. So the charges will not go from one plate to the other plate. If I connect those two plates that are here separated with the distance D, for example, so those plates are made of metal, while the material, the separation in between is of an insulator that we call here dielectric that has a permittivity of epsilon. So if I hook up those two plates to a source, what's gonna happen is the voltage difference between both those two terminals of the voltage source will basically push the charges to flow, so that would be the current, will we'll push those charges to fill up this capacitor. So remember, we, we said that the voltage difference here for the voltage source are the forces that are going to push those charges to fill up this capacitor. As long as there is a potential difference, the voltage difference across the capacitor different than the voltage difference uh, across the source. The charger will keep filling up this capacitor until the potential difference across the capacitor becomes equal to the potential difference across the source. At that point, the chargers will stop flowing into this capacitor. So what is the relationship that uh, define, that is basically defines the voltage and the charges? We have seen this expression before, Q equals to CV, where basically Q are the charges stored in this capacitor, and uh, volt, V is the voltage difference across this capacitor, and C is the capacitance. Now remember, when I talked about this capacitor being filled up with the charges, at the end, I will end up with a positive charges on the terminal that's connected the positive terminal here, and the negative charges that are equal in magnitude on the other plate, other metallic plate. So Q equals to CV, and this is the relationship between the charge, capacitance, and, uh, and the voltage, where 
the capacitance here has a unit of farad, right? And if you manipulate this, you will see that the farad is one coulomb per volt. Okay, so uh, Q equals to CV. I know what's the Q. Q are the charges that, uh, that are uh, now stored in this capacitor, driven by the voltage difference across this uh, capacitor. But what is C is the capacitance that is independent of the voltage and, and the charges. It is it depends on the geometry. So what defines the capacitance is the geometry of the, of the capacitance. So back to this figure here, the capacitance C is given by epsilon A over D. So what is A? A is the overlap area. So if they are perfectly overlapping here, and this is what the, has an, an area of A, then the other plate has an area of A as well, and they're perfectly overlapping, then the capacitance C equals to this permittivity times this overlapping area divided by the separation between those two plates, D. So it is a geometry-based quantity, does not, rely, does not depend on the charge or on the voltage, Capacitance depends on the, the geometry of the, capa of the capacitor. So you, you have seen several probably types of uh, capacitors with different uh, values, picofarad, microfarad, even nanofarad capacitors, they, or the common capacitors that you see in the, in the lab. So, uh, there are several types of capacitors and several technologies are used uh, to build those capacitors. There are some, uh, I would say most common capacitors and, and building those capacitors are thin film, are film capacitors uh, with polyester or uh, mica. And there are also uh, some uh, electrolytic caps that produce very high capacitance. So at the end, at the end, we have seen that the capacitor depends on the dielectric constant, the area divided by the distance. So in order to increase the capacitance, you can increase the area because it's proportional to the area. You can increase the dielectric constant used as a, an insulator between those two plates, or you can decrease the distance by using a higher resolution uh, fabrication uh, uh, process or technique to come up with extremely thin uh, separation of insulator between those two plates. Having said that, you have to make sure that uh, the, capac the capacitors that you're designing with the standing the breakdown voltage of your, that the, the, their breakdown voltage is greater than the application that you are trying to uh, use those capacitors for. Yes. I noticed your variable capacitor there, and I'm wondering, are there any devices that use that anymore? Because it's actually quite an old invention. Okay, so I, uh, I put two pictures for you here. One picture is the one, this bulky, this bulky capacitor, bulky variable capacitor, as you can see here, that is in the range of, um, I would say centimeters, maybe this is uh, maybe three, three centimeters, four centimeters, maybe more. This is an old technology and it's still being used so they, you can see such capacitors and some tools that are used in a state-of-the-art uh, fabrication facilities. For example, we use such capacitors to 
tune or adjust uh, high power applications. We use them, for example, in what we uh, what we call the reactive iron etcher. This is a, a tool that is used in, sure. in clean rooms, for example. But those capacitors, they handle high power. So whenever you have high power, those are the capacitors that you can use in order to to tune for tuning purposes, as we will see later on in circuit well, analysis. Sir, my my family radio is from 1948. It uses one of these to, to as a tuner to filter out certain frequencies. Yeah, yeah, that's that's yes. You're right. It used to it, it was used in in those old uh, radio. And they are still used in some high power applications that we that we require a, a wide range of uh, tunability for such applications. So we're still using those capacitors. However, I also added uh, uh, another capacitor. This is called MEMS variable capacitors. So this capacitor is in the range of micro, micrometers. So we're, we're talking here, maybe uh, 300 micron, micrometer by 100. So there, the concept itself is still, um, uh, is used and it's extremely important and it's, it's used in several applications but uh, the size basically is defined by the the power the higher the power the older the technology that you can see here for example this one that can handle higher power the smaller this the smaller the size the lower the power and the, the, the higher the integration is. So this is a new technology, relatively new technology when it comes to uh, building some variable capacitors. Now this technology, MEMS technology is used nowadays in uh, your smartphones. Those, those devices are designed and uh, they operate in smartphones where they do tunable uh, matching to between the antenna of your mobile and uh, the driver, the RF driver that is in the mobile itself to minimize the uh, mismatch between the antenna that you're holding with your hands or you're putting on the table. So the antenna is always uh, affected by the surrounding atmosphere by you mainly where you put your phone in your head and the table using Bluetooth uh, uh, Bluetooth uh, uh, headsets. So all this affects the, the antennas and causes, and causes variations in the antennas impedance and those devices are used to automatically uh, adapt and the change in order to get maximum power transfer. Get maximum power transfer to the antenna, reducing the mismatch between the antenna and the circuitry. So you see different types of uh, variable of, of variable capacitors. It depends on the applications. One of the questions was how high we were talking. Uh, uh, hundreds of watts, hundreds of watts. This, uh, this, uh, this big bulky variable capacitors and uh, and uh, reactive iron itching, for example, uh, it handles uh, hundreds of watts. But they are still there. They are still used. But not in the radios. In the radios now. Radios do not require that high of a power. And that's why higher technology, you know, other technologies stepped in and substituted those bulky 
uh, devices. That's true. That's true. Uh, because of the development of the technology, the the, the, evolve, the evolvement of new technologies and uh, the extreme high resolution uh, technologies nowadays uh, reach, they managed to go back to the equation. They managed to shrink the distance. So at the end, as I said, inverse proportional to the distance. So this equation is the one that governs the technology that we were talking about. Maintain you. You want to maintain the the capa the capacitance that you want with the smaller sizes. Fine with the higher resolution that you manage to get nowadays with very thin, with very thin films. This means very small d, which means increase the c. Right? Then you don't need that. Uh, uh, those uh, uh, areas before now be, be because of the of the uh, decrease and the D now I can decrease a right and using you know other newer material that has high dielectric constant I can also uh, this helps me to decrease the, uh, the 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 used or the needed a so the development of the technologies is leading, uh, is basically opening the door for smaller uh, devices and uh, higher integration. And you, you have seen that now, uh, you, you as an individual can go and buy some SM, SMD uh, components of, uh, made of uh, resistors, capacitors that are so tiny. You yourself, if you can, manage to do the soldering, build your uh, circuit and do the soldering under the magnifier, for example, or under uh, an electronic, uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, magnifier that goes now to very, uh, uh, you know, high magnification scale that you yourself can buy. See? You can buy, I'm not sure if you can see that, you can buy it from, from the market. And this is basically, you can do lots of, lots of work at a very high magnification, enough for you to do the soldering and work with uh, those very tiny SMD devices. Okay, so any questions so far? If you're interested in, uh, uh, you know, building and acquiring this expertise, and you would like some help about what to buy, where to buy, I'll be very happy to provide you the information that you want. Okay, so uh, those capacitors, and uh, because of the nature of that uh, capacitance, where basically has two plates and an insulator in between, they are used in several applications. Some of the applications and uh, biasing when you when you are designing, for example, an, uh, an amplifier using a transistor, you can use those uh, capacitors to separate circuits that use uh, AC signal from uh, other circuits that only use DC signal. So you don't want to mix the DC with the AC. In this case, you use those uh, capacitors at the input where you call them blocking, uh, blocking capacitors because they block the DC from going outside. So you contain, you maintain the DC uh, inside. And very high, uh, uh, I would say, uh, instrumentation, high, I mean, well, well, very expensive instrumentation that we use, that's called the, the VNA, Vector Network Analyzer. We make sure that we have this uh, uh, DC blocking at the input of those, uh, of this instrumentation to, to protect the very sensitive um, uh, RF circuitry inside this material. So we have 
no DC, no DC signal is allowed to enter into this uh, instrumentation, and that's why we use some DC blocking uh, uh, equipment right at the input. So we block the DC from the AC. Uh, VNA is a, a vector network analyzer. We use it to to measure. Uh, the the magnitude and the phase of of signals so we will sure. see we will see that this is later on when we uh, uh study the ac uh, analysis yes well again coming back to my radio my tuner um it blocks out certain frequencies because it changes the capacitive reactants and it prevents certain radio frequencies getting through as a result. So, and that's how it sort of shifts the phase. Right. But this is a blocking AC signal. You are tuning it such that it, uh, it will be blocking an AC signal, right? So here it is a part of uh, what's called a filter. This filter allows specific frequency to get in and block the other frequencies from getting in. Here, I'm talking about a DC blockage. So, for example, if I have a, a circuit here, Let's assume that this is an AC signal, right? This is an AC signal. So in this case, this DC that you're seeing here, VS, is blocked by those capacitors. So it, there's there's no volt, no current, no DC current is gonna is going to be allowed to go outside, right? Why? Because this DC signal here. This DC signal here is blocked by those two capacitors. So the voltage here inside, whatever voltage I have here, here right at this point, is not going to affect my, my load here. Why? Because that's a, a DC voltage. So this V1 has no influence whatsoever on the on the resistor that is connected through this blocking capacitor. However, this AC signal now is designed or is, is picked such that it can it can go the current, the AC current now can go through this capacitor. And this is what we call the passing AC. It can go through this capacitor and then it can reach outside to the RL. Why? Because this is a, that's an AC signal. We're gonna we're gonna talk about that later on. But what I wanted you to to see that this capacitor for DC signals it works as a blocking uh, component. It blocks this DC from going outside. Phase shift because of the relationship between the the current and the voltage for the capacitor there is a 90 degrees phase shift in, in the capacitor between the current and the voltage, right? So we were gonna see this more in more details when we talk about the AC analysis, but we know in the capacitors that there's, the capacitor creates a phase shift. So sometimes those capacitors, they are designed to give a specific phase shift. Energy storage, we talked about that. We said that those capacitors, they store energies. And they also suppress noise. And that's why and you will see at uh, 
at, uh, if you are, uh, you know, if you have the, the, the hobby of uh, building uh, circuitry and, uh, for example, and, or, or assembling, uh, let's, let's talk, give you an example, a drone, for example, if you're working on, or, on uh, the, the, the flight controller for the drone, you will see that they provide you with a capacitor, big capacitor that you have to hook up right at the, at the input of the uh, where you put where you solder your batteries input why because this capacitor is working as a smoothing capacitor that is basically absorb any fluctuation that happens in the source to to protect your circuitry okay so uh, back to the equation the expression between the charge and the, and the voltage for a capacitor Q is CV. Always remember this expression. Q equals to, to CV. Now, we have seen earlier that uh, the current is the, the flow rate of the, of the charges. So if I take now the, if I derive with respect to the, time for both sides of this equation, I get dq over dt equals to c, which is a constant, supposed to be a constant, dv over dt, right? Deriving both sides of the equation. But knowing that the current is dq over dt, here I can come up now with a relationship between the, the current and the voltage for the, for the capacitor. And we said that uh, the capacitor is gonna follow here my passive convention. So if the, if the capacitor is, be, is being charged, then the current's gonna enter its positive, its positive terminal. If the capacitor is being charged, we're basically working as a passive component then the current is going to enter its positive terminal. Okay, so uh, I equals to C dV over dt. What about vt? Then you have to take the, the integration. So if I want to calculate the voltage, then as I equals to C dV over dt, then V equals to one over C integration from T naught to T for this current I tau d tau. We tend to change the, the variable name just for simplicity because we are substituting with T. So I tau d tau and then the initial condition because I'm starting at T naught so I have to know the history before, which is basically what is what is the voltage that was at this capacitor right at this T naught because I'm starting here with T naught. It's not is it's not from zero. It's from T naught. So I need to know the starting point, this initial condition at T naught, which is the V T naught. So this is how we calculate the voltage, and as you can see. Due to this expression, I can say that the voltage here is a continuous. The voltage is continuous. Whenever you have an integration, it is a continuous function. However, look at the, at the function here, the current. The current in the capacitor is not continuous. The current in the capacitor can jump abruptly. Why? Because it depends on this dv over dt. If the if dv is positive, then the current is positive. If, if dv over dt is negative, being being you know discharged, then the current would be negative. So you have abrupt changes in the current for the capacitor. However, you have a continuous a smooth uh, variation I'm not talking here about the oscillation. I'm talking here about uh, 
the a, a capacitor if if a capacitor is being charged then dv over dt is positive if a capacitor is being discharged then dv over dt is negative so look at the look at the at the voltage at the supply at the supply of the uh, of the uh, of the voltage for this capacitor is this capacitor charging or is this capacitor discharging so uh, when it comes to the power the power p equals to vi as we know this is what we call the instantaneous power p equals to vi which means i have v and i have i which is c dv over dt now the power is the the energy rate so this power could be uh, charging this capacitor or discharging or being discharged from this capacitor, right? But it is the energy rate. It defines how, what is the rate of the, of the energy that being flowing into this capacitor or what is the rate of the energy that's being, you know, dissipated from this capacitor. So always remember, power is the energy rate. So if I want to calculate the total energy, then I have to integrate over time. So integrating over time, which is basically the W here, the energy here, W is the, the integration for the, for the power. Right? The integration for the, for the power. So if you integrate the power, well, at the end, energy is an energy, right? Energy is an energy. So if you want to calculate the energy, this is how we we, we, we have to integrate this, this rate and then finding the total energy over time then would give me W equals half CV squared, which is the energy stored in the capacitor. Now, the integration here for uh, V dV over dT, so if you, if you just take this dV, V dV over dT, this equals to half d over dt for the function v squared, right? And then the integration will take out the, the derivative and you will end up with half c v squared, which is the energy stored and the capacitor. Any questions so far? Yeah. Any questions so far? Okay, so let's move on. So keep in mind that those capacitors, uh, if they if, if they have a, a DC voltage applied, in other words, if the voltage across the capacitor is not the is not uh, changing then in this case back to the expression i equals to c dv over dt if the voltage across is not the changing then dv over dt is zero and in this case the current would be zero right so and this happens when the voltage across the capacitor reaches the same voltage of the uh, of the source. In this case, there will be no flowing in the current, and in this case, the uh, the current would be zero. So, an example to this is if I take a voltage source here, where I have a resistor and uh, 
I have a capacitor. We've seen this one before in 1010. As long as uh, when once I turn on, if the if there was no uh, voltage across this, so zero charges across the capacitor, and I turned on this voltage source, then the current will flow here in order to charge this capacitor. As long as this voltage, now the voltage drop across this capacitor will start to increase. It will start to increase till the voltage across the capacitor becomes the same as the voltage across the, the source. Once the voltage across the capacitor, Vc here reaches Vs, then the potential difference across the resistor would be zero. Why? Because if I take this as my reference and the voltage here, Vc reaches Vs, then the potential difference across this resistor, Vr, Vr becomes zero. Once Vr becomes zero, then I is going to be zero because no more charges are going to flow to uh, fill up this capacitor anymore. Why? Because the potential difference across the capacitor became the same as the potential difference across the source. And in this case, the potential difference across the resistor becomes zero and no current is, is going to flow into the capacitor anymore. The capacitor has reached its maximum uh, voltage. Yes, the capacitor in this case will stop charging. It will reach it. The maximum would be, the maximum voltage across the capacitor in this case would be, would be Vs. If the voltage is still less, then more charges are going to flow into the capacitor and will start, you know, accumulated stored in the capacitor till the voltage across the capacitor reaches the Vs. And in this case, I will stop. Now, we'll be dealing with ideal capacitors that do not dissipate energy. However, in reality, we've seen that uh, there are no ideal cases. There will be some leakage capacitors that are connected in parallel and it would be in the range of 100 mega ohm, for example. However, this, uh, this model that has, let's say, 100 mega ohm, is the the one that is responsible for the leakage so if you charge the capacitor and then you disconnect the capacitor although you have specific charges now that you have stored in this in this capacitor but due to this self uh, leakage uh, resist the self resistance there will be some leakage through this uh, capacitor however the capacity, the resistance, sorry, the, the resistor through the resistance, but this capacity, this resistance is uh, as large as in the range of, uh, as you can see here, 100 mega ohm. So that's going to result into a very small leakage current that can uh, dissipate the energy stored in this capacitor. Yes, go ahead. So this is a really maybe juvenile question, but what is the purpose of capacitors? Because I understand, like, why wouldn't one just use a resistor if you needed to reduce the current or the power going into the next component in the system? Okay, so capacitors, capacitors in general are uh, passive devices that they store energy. Now it depends on how I connect this energy storing component in my circuit, I can uh, I can have tremendous applications. One of them, as uh, your colleague was referring to earlier, uh, as we will see later on, if I have a capacitor here that stores 
uh, energy in the in form of the electric field that is connected in series with another device that is called inductor that stores energy in magnetic field. I can come up with uh, an impedance where the effect of uh, uh, of this capacitor would be cancelled by by the inductor. Now, if I change, I, I if I change the I tune the value of this capacitor, I manage to get this effect that is a function of a frequency changing based on the on the frequency that I want by how much I I vary. But this is gonna we'll look at that later on when we reach and we we'll introduce the impedances. We will see how does the impedance here cancels uh, uh, the impedance of the capacitor cancels the impedance of the inductor so this is one of the applications this so if you one they just cancel each other out right right what's they the purpose of them is it just to be used as a pid controller to even out the signal or change its frequency well they cancel they cancel out each other at very specific frequency, not at all the frequencies. Mm -hmm. So you, you have to know, you, you need to know that those components, they are, uh, they depend on the frequency. They are a frequency dependent uh, components. So it depends on how much is the frequency. So in other words, here based on uh, the value of the capacitance and the value of the inductor, I can come up with one specific frequency that they cancel uh, themselves out at. But if I apply other frequency, then no, they're not going to cancel themselves out because they cancel themselves out based on their values at a specific frequency. So by changing this capacitor, by you know using the variable capacitor and changing this capacitor, capacitance in this capacitor, I can change at what a frequency I want the cancellation to happen. Oh, that's so cool. So it's like the radio tuner he was talking exactly. about. Exactly. So you can look at it as, uh, uh, as a circuit that picks up specific frequency based on how you want. And that's right. When you change those old type radios by changing, you know, the, rotating the knob this way, you, you can see that you are picking different frequencies. And this is what's happening for, this is one of the applications, by the way. We have seen, we've talked about severals, and uh, I can go back here and to the slide here, where we said that we can use those capacitors in, the block, in, in the blocking the signal, to block signals, to block the DC signal from AC signal. So in, in some RF circuits, we don't want to mix the DC and the, R, and, and, and the AC. And in this circuit that I have shown you here, I, I, I wanted to keep the DC blocked in the middle. I, don't, I didn't want this VS that is a DC signal to affect my, uh, my other uh, you know, part of the circuits, which are here outside C1 and C2. So it's essentially using them for employing them as high pass and low pass filters? You can look. You can look at that. You can look at uh, at them this way because cool. uh, because at the end this VS that DC has a frequency of zero zero frequency, right? So you can look at this C1 and C2 as a high pass filter. So this DC signal is considered from the uh, you know a, a signal that has a zero frequency. From considered from the you know from as from can be blocked by this high pass filter. So this the C1 and C2 here you can look at them as high pass filters. They don't allow frequent signals with the frequencies uh, at low frequency, which is zero, is one of them to pass from one side to another. So in this case, because of this DC, this DC is gonna be confined in between those two C1 and C2, will be blocked by C1 and C2, will not affect my circuit outside. So this is one of them. This is this, a second application that you can look at. As we will see later on, once we introduce the impedance, you will see that uh, there is a, a phase shift between the current and the voltage 
for the capacitors and for the inductors, they're, they're completely different. Completely different, right? We'll talk about how is this is going to affect uh, the phase and how is this is used in AC signal and how is this, you know, basically uh, answer the, the inductor capacitor that you have seen in series and uh, based on the impedance and how they this impedance is, is being canceled at this specific frequency. Did I answer your question? That's so cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Sure. Yes. Um, another application, there exists something called the tank circuit, which is the basis of oscillators. You have a capacitor and inductor in parallel, and their exchanging of energy is what causes a current to oscillate. I believe the resonant frequency is when the capacitive and inductive reactances cancel and you get pure DC resistance. At the end, you're looking, yes, uh, this is the definition of the resonance. And as we, even this inductor, this inductor uh, and, uh, and capacitor that they are, they are in series, they resonate right at that frequency that makes this, those two impedance cancel out each other. So we're, we're probably we're not gonna talk about the resonators, uh, but once we introduce the AC, signal and we see uh, how are those two different types uh, elements capacitors and inductors that create that makes the diff two different uh, impedances they cancel each other and they also create some uh, resonators that that basically when they resonate they allow maximum uh, energy either to be passed or blocked based on the topology of the resonator. So we have different topologies of resonator. We have series resonator and we have a parallel resonator, right? However, this uh, probably I can later on discuss it on the side, but uh, for the time being, uh, let's uh, stick uh, to what we are covering today and now go to the parallel capacitors. I, I, I'm sure what I'm covering today, I have shown you before in Physics 1010, but for the sake of uh, refreshing your memories and for the sake of uh, making sure that you, you, you've you seen this material again, since it is uh, it is part of the, uh, of the topics that we're covering in this course. And as we will see later on, we, once we introduce the capacitor and inductors, we can we are going to visit the uh, the op-amps again to show you uh, a couple of uh, applications that require the existence of uh, of the capacitors in order to to operate. But we will do this this after we finish with the material in this chapter. So parallel capacitors. Parallel capacitor. If I have parallel capacitors, then in this case, I have. I know that you know that uh, the total capacitance would be the the summation of those capacitors. So here, C1, C2, C3, and C, and all of them are connected in parallel. Do you agree with me? If I am to to color the node again, the node, the node is uh, the the electrical, the unique uh, electric potential, and the whole wiring, if I color them here, then I think you agree with me that those capacitors are connected in parallel. Both of them are sharing the same node. So in this case, the C equivalent is the summation of those, of those capac capacitances. Okay, uh, so how did we come up with this uh, uh, conclusion? Why capacitors in parallel are added? Well, if you go back to the definition of the KCL and you took the KCL right at this node, you can see that I have here, I is entering 
all of them are leaving so all of them are positive and i here is so minus i plus i1 plus i2 plus i3 plus i n equals to zero take i to the other side you're going to end up with the current r uh, the current i equals the summation of all the current and this is from kcm now if you apply the expression that we have derived earlier which is i equals to c dv over dt in this case then you have i1 equals to c1 dv over dt now here don't forget that since those components are in parallel then they share the same voltage so if the same voltage is the same as across all of them then dv over dt also should be the same so if i substitute now i1 with c1 dv over dt c2 dv over dt c3 cn same dv over dt and i took dv over dt outside then I will end up with the summation of the capacitance. So C I equals to C1 plus C2 plus C3 plus Cn times dV over dt. And this is the C equivalent. So this is how we can prove that capacitors that are in parallel, the equivalent capacitance is the summation of those capacitors. Now, what about the, capac the capacitors that are in series? Capacitors that are in series, basically, the, if we look here at, the, at this loop, then they share the same current, right? All of them, they share the same current. In this case, the C equivalent, if you look at the C equivalent by all those, then this C equivalent, has basically the voltage total V across. But how did we come up with this expression? One over C equivalent equals to one over C1 plus one over C2 plus one over C3 plus one over Cn. How did we come up with this expression? Again, applying KVL. If you apply KVL here in this loop, what you're going to end up with is, again, if I apply KVL, and then let's do this as a refreshment, we see that the loop here is entering this negative V, so I will write it as minus V, and then plus V1, plus V2, plus V3, plus Vn equals to zero, or V equals the summation of those voltages, right? Now, what is V1? V1, from what we have seen earlier, if I equals, if I equals C dV over dt, then V, which is a function of time, equals to 1 over C integration, recall T naught to T for I, you can keep it tau, or you can put T, doesn't matter, plus v at t naught because since i'm starting here from t naught then i have to know the history before t naught what happened how much was i'm starting at t naught then i know i need to know well how much was the voltage at that point remember what did we say about the about this this expression that is an integration it's a smooth smooth continuous it's a continuous function. So I need to know the value from where I stopped. I don't have abrupt changes. I need to know how much was the voltage right at the point where I'm starting the integration. And that's why I have V, T, naught. So if I come here and substitute the voltages, V1, V2, V3, and Vn with those expressions, so it will be one over C1, Remember, the current is the same, right? So the current is the same in all of them. So that's why you will see 
the integration over I tau, D tau, the same for all of them. What's going to be different is the value of the C and uh, whatever value was in this capacitor. But if you take out the integration, you're going to end up with the summation of those 1 over Cs. Right? So, which means that this is 1 over C equivalent, because if you go back to this, to the circuit, and you want to find, write the voltage, you know that the voltage here, Vt equals to 1 over C equivalent, then integration from T naught to T for I tau D tau, right? Plus V T naught. Sorry for the tight space here. I can rewrite this one if you want. For this, so for this circuit, I know that Vt equals to 1 over C equivalent from T naught to T for, for I tau D tau plus V T tau. And this is what we, where basically V T naught is the summation of all those Vs. Right? So this is my V T naught. So in this case, I have proved that capacitors that are connected in series, the equivalent for the equivalent capacitance for them is the the inverse of the equivalent is the summation of the inverses of all those capacitors. No, no, this is, no, uh, th this is just to prove to you and to show you why and how the uh, capacitance of uh, capacitors that are in series basically uh, has this equivalency. So in series, the inverse of the equivalent is the summation of the, of the inverses. So... In summary here for the series parallel capacitors, you can look at capacitors that are in parallel uh, this way. So let me give you an example here. I have here C1 and C2 that are in parallel, right? So you can look at, you can look at that as if you have uh, a parallel plate. Uh, let me probably go to... Uh, slide here, insert a slide. So capacitors in parallel. In parallel is basically uh, you can you can look at it as so here I have uh, this circuit that I have here C1 and C2, right? So you can look at this one as, and I'll draw it here for you. Uh, so this is a capacitor uh, here. with the, uh, let's say, D1, the gap is D1, and this is A1, right? And the material here is Epsilon1. 
So you can think about it as if you have two capacitors that are connected. I'll do this in a different color so it, uh, it looks, you know, clear, clearer here. So as if you have two capacitors that you have put together. Right, so this one is A2, and this one, let's assume that they have, for example, the same D, but the material here is different. So you can think about it as, th those are in parallel, right? As two, two capacitors that are connected in parallel, so you look at it as, as, as if you have increased the area, and maintaining the same distance with, between, which is fine, but you use, for example, different material also. So at the end, when you say C1 plus C2, think think about it as two uh, capacitors. Look here, they share the same voltage. So if I am to, if I am to, let's say, put a resistor here and a voltage, VSR. So this is exactly the same as if I have here. So the, this metal, right, the, the upper metal is, is the same for both of them. So look at the, this is this plate, they are, is connected. And the other plates are connected together. So this gives you an idea about what do two uh, capacitors in parallel look like. However, if I am now to do the same for capacitors in series, so if capacitors in series, I can look at those capacitors, capacitors in series. And remember when I when I talk he, here in this circuit, uh, I'm talking about uh, what's going to happen to those capacitors when I switch on or put them in the circuit. They're going to see some variation and then they're going going to stop. But what I care about here is the is the following. Uh, so this is C1, C2. I just want to show you. Uh, how you can look at them if I am to to draw the first the first capacitor. So this is the first capacitor. Right, so, and then from the middle connected to the uh, next, to this, to the, to that plate. So here I have the plate like this. like this. So here it is connected to this upper plate and here connected to the lower plate. So at the end, this is how, this is how those two capacitors are connected and, and series. So this one is A1, uh, D1, Epsilon1. The other one is is A2, uh, the gap is D2, and the material is Epsilon2. So this is how two uh, capacitors are connected in series, just to try to give you a 3D visualization to what's happening. And this is the upper one is two capacitors that are connected in parallel. Any questions so far?
do you have any question? Well, I I kept them D one and D two to be to to be the same, just to make sure that the plates are connected. They're touching, just to show you that the plates are. Definitely, they can be different, but uh, you need to make sure that uh, the the plates would be electrically connected. But just here, I, I gave you this example as if you have you know the same uh, the same material that you are you are separating them by by only the, the the distance by the 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 insulator in between. So the insulator is is the one that defines which one is A1, which one is A2, because for A1 it is epsilon one, for A2 it is epsilon two. So this is just to make it, you know to to make it uh, look uh, easier to to understand, not more than that. Of course you can change make it different D's and at the same time, make sure that the material is connected, the plates are connected. Any other questions? Thank you so much and have a good day. We'll see you next Thursday. <laughs>